Hi, it's Matthew Reed here from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, and today we have an 18th century European long case or tall case clock movement that has a missing part. So we're going to design, prototype, and make that part. As you can see, the clock has a single hand and it strikes the number of hours on the hour. But we soon realise that the connecting piece between the movement and the dial is missing. This piece is called the lifting piece and that's what we're going to make today. You can see here the hour wheel with the 12 lobed cam that lifts the lifting piece once for every hour that passes. Looking at the front plate of the clock, we can estimate the overall shape of the lifting piece given that we know the angle between the lobes of the lifting cam and the lifting piece needs to be about 45 degrees. And we know that the lifting piece has to connect the cam that we've just seen and the arbor that protrudes through the front plate on the right here. So first I'm gonna liberate our our wheel and cam by removing the hand. Then I'm going to take a piece of brass wire um, to make a prototype and quickly make um, a loop on the end which is going to fit on that square that protrudes through the plate. All this can be quite uh, rough and ready. Doesn't need to take us uh, a long time. So the piece of wire now fits on the square without any play in there. And we can see that the centre line of the clock on which the um, lifting piece is going to be released as in at the 12 o'clock position, for instance, is that's described on the plate. So this is incredibly useful. Um, we can estimate uh, at about 45 degrees from the center hole that you can see here in the middle of the frame. And then the equivalent that we can bend back to make the actual nose of the lifting piece. As I say, this can all be quite quick. We can always bend things to work and so that's my first kind of um, estimate of what's going to be needed. This, when I come to try this prototype piece, in fact, the clock doesn't release properly. It might run to warning, but um, it's too high and a little bit too long as well, which is absolutely fine. In order to make the testing easier, I'm going to remove the count wheel which means that the clock will just through, run through one striking cycle every time it's released. Just speeds things up a little bit. So the first time I try the cam in place, what I find is that the warning piece when the clock runs to warning just before striking isn't being released so a little adjustment and try it again this is all done pretty quickly as you can see just driving the striking train with my finger and I can now see that the striking train releases and runs to warning so I'm just gonna have a closer look at that warning flag to check that the pin is landing in about the same place that it did when the original piece was fitted and we can see that it's actually incredibly close so very happy there and in fact when I look on the front plate of the clock and this is a really good reason not to refinish clocks um, because they're often little sort of witness marks and I can see some scratches running across very similar angle to my temporary lifting piece and a kind of oily mark on the plate where the thing has terminated. So this all helps me think that I'm kind of in the ballpark. So we've got our prototype, now it's time to turn it into a steel or iron uh, final piece. 
Now, what we've got here on the back of the clock movement is the count wheel detent, which is forged. I'm not going to forge the lifting piece, but I'm going to use the count wheel detent as a kind of guide, a style guide. Now, this bit of work is hidden under the clock dial, but nevertheless, it's kind of a nice idea, at least, to make something that looks reasonably, arguably, uh, authentic, if you like, uh, when the dial is removed. I'm not going to try and age this piece of material. I don't need it to look old. I just kind of want to be able to um, make something that I consider to look reasonably pleasing. In fact, the bit of brass wire would probably do the job absolutely fine, but um, might be frowned on. So I've got a piece of mild steel here. Uh, originally, it would have been wrought iron. Now the mild steel is great because it's reasonably easy to cut, it's uh, perfectly durable for this um, purpose and you can forge it by heating to red which we're going to do when we come to bending the piece of material. So I've scribed out some rough shape, I'm going to centre punch the steel and then drill for the across flats size of the square that protrudes through the frame. In order to file the hole uh, from round to square for it to be a good fit, um, it's useful if you have both a square and a three square as in a triangular file. Now, uh, intuitively, a square file will make a square hole, but the reality is that it will make a square-ish hole, but the corners will be rounded because of the way that the file is made. And it's very easy to get the corners more than 90 degrees, which means the whole thing is sloppy. So I use a square file to rough out, slightly undersized. Then I use a three square file, so a triangular file, with one set of teeth, or one face, ground completely smooth. It has no teeth on one side. And the purpose of this is to generate two very sharp corners. And what I do is I kind of rotate the triangular file within the hole. And that means that the side with the sharp corners is constantly moving around from one flat of the square to the other and it means that the square is developed with sharp corners which is what we want for it to be a good fit. So once we've got our um, lifting piece fitting on the arbor we can begin to rough out the overall shape. So remember this is just two points really, we've got our square and we need the nose of the lifting piece to be in the right place. Everything else is just holding those two things in place. So um, I'm going to make it tapered, as I said, to broadly match or marry with the camp wheel dent so they look uh, broadly similar. And so I start by roughing out the shape with a hacksaw. Once I've done that and liberated the overall shape, it's time to begin filing. So I'm just going to file it flat for the time being, uh, again, just to begin to refine the shape. Once I've done that, I then begin to round some of the surfaces, as I said, so it's kind of in the manner of the count wheel dent. So once we have the overall shape sawn and filed and some shape on it then I'm going to uh, bend the end round and so I do heat it and bend it when it's red hot which just reduces the opportunity for it to crack and then uh, I've left the thing over length so I can cut it down with a piercing saw and then I can try with the hand in place and the dial in place and slowly begin to shorten the nose of the lifting piece until um, the hand is released in the correct position. In fact, because I've got other work to do on this clock, I'm going to leave the very final adjustment so the 
kind of last 30 seconds, if you like, until the whole clock is finished and I've done other things like bushing. So there we are. There's our finished lifting piece on the front plate of the clock. Hope you found that of use. I would say the main uh, takeaway here is to use CAD drawing, if you have it, to draw something out. Um, but then importantly, personally, I wouldn't spend too much time making a prototype. Use the materials you've got at hand, wire, brass, steel, aluminium, even cardboard for some things, just to get a rough idea of the shape. And then you can go ahead and make the final thing. So, as always, thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. That encourages us to make more content. And we will see you again soon.